The life of a beetle. Let's be honest here guys, none of us are here for Marie, Charlie, the fish or the geckos. We're all here for the beetles. The sun beetles. These colourful little bugs fast became one of the most popular invertebrates kept around the world. Their easy care, minimal requirements and laid back nature makes them incredible pets. But they're also equipped with many designs and adaptations, allowing them to thrive in their natural environment and utilise the world around them. Subscribe and join the team. I'm Sean and welcome to the SG Animals universe. These beetles start life as grubs. They spend their time under the soil and seldom breach the surface. Life underground protects them from birds and other wildlife that would make a fast, easy meal out of them. They typically feed on rotten wood and vegetation fallen on the forest floor. Depending on temperature, they'll typically grow from larvae to beetle in around 4 months, sometimes faster and sometimes slower. They'll create a cocoon from soil and faeces, combined together with their own saliva. And after a while, they'll eventually emerge as fully formed beetles with an array of new abilities. Hooks on the end of each leg help them to climb trees to find the freshest fruit. They spend much of their time in the safety of the trees, but return to the soil throughout the night. A simple yet effective cover. When threatened, they tuck their legs in, making them almost impossible to grip. Impossible for a bird's beak to hold onto. And if that wasn't enough, they excrete a foul smelling liquid from their rear. And since these adult beetles only live around 5 months, with their primary objective to mate and continue their lineage, it doesn't take much to trigger them into using their natural defences. Tucked inside, they have wings that allow them to fly. Their bright coloration helps them blend in with leaves and fruit, and can even serve as a warning to predators. And thankfully today, we're joined by Shelby from Shelby on Safari, to dive further into the behaviour of these fascinating creatures. Hey, thank you so much for inviting Maui and I to join in on your video about sun beetles. I am so excited to share with you a research project that we did on, well, my favourite invertebrate that we have in our collection. Don't tell the others. They are charismatic and colourful, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you what we did, what we found, and how it can help your own sun beetle colony. So let's get started. The goal of our research was simple. How do sun beetles use their enclosure? Do they prefer certain areas and avoid others. Using this information, we can make better husbandry decisions and spruce up the areas that are not used at all by the sun beetles and hopefully make them more biologically relevant. Looking at enclosure use has actually been done in the zoo world for at least the past 30 years in a wide variety of species. However, not many invertebrates are the subject of enclosure use studies, which is another reason why we wanted to do this. For this project, we use Modified Spread of Participation Index, or SPI for short. That means that we divided the enclosure into different zones that were biologically relevant to the sun beetles. Specifically, for this project, we divided it into six zones the surface of the ground, living plants, artificial plants, rotten wood, spindly twigs, and the sixth zone was out of sight, which we assumed would be subterranean. As mentioned in SG Animals' previous videos on sun beetles, sun beetle larvae live exclusively in soil and rotten wood substrates. So having a deep substrate is vital to one sun beetle enclosure. 
As adults, some beetles can also burrow beneath the soil and even fly. So it's important to have these two behaviors in consideration for your enclosure layout. Over the course of nine months, over various different times of the day, at the beginning of each hour, we took count of how many sun beetles were in each zone. And if the beetles weren't seen in any zone, they were assumed to be under the soil. The population size of our colony was factored in to the SPI calculations. This meant that we were evaluating the proportion of individuals occupying each zone. Each time we collected data, we not only looked at how many sun beetles were in each zone, but also took note of the temperature, humidity, and if the lighting was on or off. We then used these later for correlation tests. The spindly twigs were quite an important aspect of the enclosure, it seemed, in our study. For we noticed when the lights were switched on, some beetles made greater use of these elevated areas and actually displayed basking behavior. Therefore, providing some beetles with the opportunity to bask in elevated zones via twigs or whatever you have available to you may be useful for improving their welfare. We also noticed when the temperature increased, some beetles used their enclosure a lot more unevenly, meaning they use a variety of different zones rather than just one, which typically was the subterranean one when the light was off or the temperatures were low. Therefore, having higher temperature can also help increase sun beetle enclosure use. However, it is important to bear in mind that you don't have to have a high temperature all of the time. In fact, it's nice to have some variation like there would be in the wild. So the two big things that we took away from our study was that some beetles should have an opportunity to bask in the sun or an artificial light, and they seem to gravitate towards parts of their enclosure that allow them to bask. In particular, for the second point, this was displayed in our colony by using elevated zones or the spindly twigs throughout their enclosure to get closer to the light. And while a lot of private collections may use sun beetle larvae for reptile food, we personally enjoy keeping them because they're beautiful, colorful, and their poo smells good. <laughs> our research not only helped shape our husbandry practice as private collectors, but also as zoo professionals, hoping to raise awareness of the amazing world of invertebrates and how sadly they are understudied. If you're a private collector and have some beetles of your own, why not try doing a similar study? Seeing how your some beetles use your enclosure that you have for them, if they prefer certain areas than others, and if you notice that they enjoy basking in the light as well. Thanks again for inviting me and we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks for joining us today, Shelby. An interesting study in looking to the beetles and their preferred grounds. A brilliant way of surveying the areas the beetles are most likely to use, so we can adapt and alter the enclosures to provide the best husbandry we possibly can for our animals. Now I'm not certain about other countries and their laws, but these beetles and their larvae are readily available at many reptile shops and online here in the UK. The grubs are frequently sold as reptile food for animals like Charlie. So if you're interested in keeping some for yourself, why not check out the SG Animals Care Guide we created last year? How to build an enclosure and how to keep them comfortable and thriving going forward. Our population has been self-sustaining for around a year now. And hopefully, if we're lucky, there'll be many more to come. <laughs>